This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello everybody and welcome to Writers on Film. My name's John Bleasdell, I am a writer and film critic and today I'm going to be talking to Sam Wasson who is the author of many books including The Big Goodbye, his history of the making of Chinatown, a fantastic book and if you're interested in that there is an earlier episode from earlier last year that you can uh, listen to where we talk about that exclusively but today we're going to be talking about his new book Hollywood and Oral History uh, which he has written uh, with his co-author Janine Basinger and uh, is out now it's a brilliant comprehensive history of Hollywood taken from the people who were there when it happened from the direct from the AFI archives some amazing access some amazing previously unseen comments and versions and stories and anecdotes it's a, a really a real eye-opener anyway we're going to talk about that there's not n- enough of me blathering on i think it's uh i think it's um better that we let sam uh, uh give us all the all the low down if you enjoyed the episode please remember to like subscribe do all those things that i tell you every week uh, uh if you do them it really really helps uh, you can follow me at Twitter for as long as Twitter exists, D-R-J-O-N-T-Y. But before you do any of that, please enjoy the conversation. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really proud, really proud of this. It's it's a it's a brilliant. I mean, I love histories of Hollywood, and I love um, you know Otto Friedrich's City of Nets and and all those sort of ones that give you a really a grand sort of stretch. But I think this, with its sort of going from from the inside of the industry, from the people who are actually doing this stuff, gives kind of strangely gives a unique perspective because you would have expected them to have you know, for you to have heard all those stories, but so much of it felt new to me. Yeah, it is new. It was, a lot of it was new to us because these are, these, these interviews have been collecting for 50 years at the AFI. And, uh, you know, as is the case with a lot of archives, they don't always bring their, their material out to the public or the public doesn't even know about it. And so, uh, they're new for that reason. Um, literally new i mean they haven't seen the light of day some of them and also because of the nature of the interviews they weren't done for the press they were done for the students and it allowed the filmmakers um a little freedom um to uh to speak more honestly and to do some teaching and to not just speak in the way of a, the conventional soundbite the way a filmmaker would speak to a journalist on a press junket or something so you get stuff in there that you don't really get you know, anywhere else. Jack Benny, for instance, uh, talking about working with Lubitsch, to be or not to be. Um, um, that's just one example. You know, there, there are 3,000 of these things. So um, it goes it goes on and on. I'm glad you've got, I'm glad that came through in, in the book. It's funny you mentioned Lubitsch because like he he kind of turned, is one of the heroes that, that sort of pops out. There are certain figures who are kind of unanimously graded Mm -hmm. and they're not necessarily the figures that you're expecting Lubitsch that's that that's exactly it I mean that's Lubitsch everyone agrees on you know not even Hitchcock not even Chaplin there are some people who have their their gripes you know oh Chaplin is sentimental you know I don't agree obviously but Mm. um or or Hitchcock he's making movies about a very very small population uh i i i can see that but of course i think the work transcends it but lubitsch the theme is giant the innovation is giant the humanity is giant um uh a- absolute across the board universal acclaim and i think that exists actually even today for filmmakers you know i i think on that basis you could make the argument that lubitsch was the greatest of all time to say nothing of the films 
you know, the films themselves are, you know, there's barely a bad one in the lot. Absolutely, absolutely, and there and it's such a deep bench as well. You know, you, it goes back so far. It's not it's not just the sort right. of the hits, so to speak, or the ones that are most uh, sort of you see the most on television. Right, his German silent films are are charming. You know, even before he came to Hollywood. I mean, this is like this is a guy who was a, a born a born filmmaker. And I mean, going right back to the to the very beginning, then um, I, I like the I love the even the start where you have, you know, if if um, is it D.W. Griffiths has, had got off the train at this point and not that point, we wouldn't be talking about Hollywood. You know, if it had been raining, it was raining in the station. And he was like, no, let's continue. Um, those sort of legends. There's so much fun to have there as well. Well, people, people forget Hollywood is such a prominent part of our lives that people forget that there was a time when it didn't exist. Mm. You know, um, it, it's not like most other industries. You know, this was an industry based on technology. And so we had to wait many thousands of years for the movies. And so the people who made it didn't know what they were doing. They were playing. They were improvising. So. The fact that Hollywood is in Hollywood was itself an improvisation, partly because of the sunshine, as we all know, and also to escape the um, the patents of the East. You know, there were very strict rules at the turn of the century about who could use cameras and did they have to pay for the rights to have cameras and all of the equipment. And um, to to escape that, they they fled across the country near the border to Mech near so they could cross the border. If they were both fabulous and fun part of film history, there were spies watching them, you know, secret agents to make sure, you know, that that part of it I always found delicious that as they're inventing this art form and this industry, they're they're actually fighting the law. It's sort of an outlaw, yeah, piratical sort of feel yeah. to it. And I love right. the idea as well, right. like Hollywood, you know, there's Holly, you think of like Christmas and snow and wood, you think of forests and, and there's none of that yeah. in Hollywood. None know? of that. None of that. None of that. No, just some citrus trees and some chaparral. It's like Rick Blaine, you know, going to Casablanca for the waters. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, it is. Yeah, we have a line by H.W. Swanson, who is a agent in the early days saying sunset wasn't even paved yeah so you know there there the book starts at the time before hollywood and and the the community that you that, that they all talk about as well there's this sort of real sense of it being a, a village almost uh, of of creators who are all talking to each other and going to each other's houses i mean that that goes on you know well into sort of chaplin and and people like that having dinner together every night and it goes it goes through the whole it goes through the whole studio era, you know, I mean, people, you know, you were under contract to a studio. It created a real sense of um, simpatico and camaraderie. Um, and also because this thing was being created across all studios, it created a camaraderie between the studios. You know, there was, of course, a natural competition, but it was not. Um, it, it, it was not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It was not host, a hostile competition, you know? They all worked together. Studio heads worked with studio heads and they had to trade stars and trade talent. Uh, uh, studio heads played cards, you know, on a weekly basis. Um, and also being that they were mostly, you know, lower, lower middle class immigrants originally, there was this sense of outsiders against the American mainstream. So all of this facilitated that re very real sense of, and of course, making a movie is not painting a painting. It's not writing a book. You have to be able to work with other personalities, hundreds of other personalities. So these people were all trained in community. And, and um, uh, the idea that, you know, Hollywood is full of ego and all of that stuff really is only a later phenomenon when those communities start to break down. But back in the era that you're talking about, no, there was there was no room for for ego, you know. I mean, it's like a contract players. We often think of being sort of restrained by their contracts, but the the flip side of that is it gives everyone a lot of security. They know they know they're going to be here for a few years, so they're 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 sort of willing to. Well, they're comfortable. They can they can relax and and they can just concentrate on what they're doing. 
Yeah, the idea of the contract as a negative force is, is a new idea based upon the ideas that we have about power in the last 50 years. Power and leadership were not negative um, phenomena in those days. I mean, the government worked. World War II was a good war. And like you said, they were kept as a, they were they had a continuous and happy employment. And also, um, they weren't they didn't see themselves as artists yet. So it was not about their vision and fighting the corporation, which is another point. The studios weren't corporations yet. When they became corporations, then there became a, 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 when they became freelance workers for corporations and the work started to dry up. Well, then everybody really had to fight more for their vision and their piece of the pie. But for the era that we're talking about, you know, by and large, no, there was still Jack Warner could still be a schmuck, as we see in the Olivia de Havilland case and the story of Betty Davis and the story of Jimmy Cagney. And, and um, Harry Cohn was, of course, you know, grumpy and difficult. But the bottom line for these guys was all that they loved their talent and needed to keep their talent happy, you know, um, and did. Every every sort of studio head that you sort of mention and, and you have people giving their testimony, there's always somebody who says, yeah, yeah, they were a bit of an asshole, but they yes, were really exactly. honest or they did this for me or they helped me out in this way. Right, right. No, I don't want to create the impression that they were all angels. We we, uh, we, we were painstaking about creating complex portraits, but that were still finally in their corner. Um, and that was because of the testimony that we received. You know, this book is not our opinion. You know, we, we, we were the messenger here. Although you and Janine Basinger, your uh, your co-author, um, you do quote yourselves as well in, yeah. the, yes. in the in the body of the text, and not sort of like as a, a, a editor's note or anything like that, but like as we're, we're going to be witnesses as well to this. Right. We we went back and forth on that, and finally we decided to come in where we thought was necessary, not to give our opinion so much, but as to create narrative ligature um, and and transition. You know, so it so it ran smoother. Our voices are are very um, uh, I, the, to the best of our ability, um, objective uh, and and um, his, ba based in in giving historical information. And we let the opinions go to the people who were there themselves. Before we started uh, recording this, you were talking about uh, you, you're making a documentary of another project. I'm not sure how much you're allowed to say about that. Yeah, so no, I, don't say that yet. Don't I, I, say that I, yet. I won't. I won't. I won't Go ahead. Won't specify. But as I was reading this, I was thinking, wow, this would make a great documentary as well. This would make. A, yeah, well, we're know. working on that. We're definitely working on that on that, too, um, because obviously all of this material is is not exists not just in text form but in audio form right so we're working on a project where and you can hear these people have these actual conversations um and uh you know there have been other histories of the movies obviously but but none with that you know they're mm. basically just talking heads people you know looking back not 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 necessarily the people who were there it's certainly not three thousand of them one of the things that i thought was really interesting and really sort of opened my eyes is the 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 sort of the legend that we have or the legend or the the what would you what would i call it the testimony maybe the better word for it of of sort of victims of the studio uh period and i'm thinking of uh blonde the recent uh film by um uh oh its name's just got out of my head what's the it maryland called? movie the maryland, the maryland movie, movie. Yeah. yeah yeah andrew dominic yes. the yes. name of the the from okay. joyce okay. joyce carol oates's novel and also the judy garland picture to some degree sort mm -hmm. of very much depicting their woes as not necessarily exclusively the fault of the studio system but certainly inst partly instigated by that and, and yeah so, so no i'm i'm glad you brought that up that that is an absolute myth i mean these people were not victims of the studio system if anything the studios were victims of of them and uh we go into that in the book you know judy garland and marilyn had a, a tremendous emotional difficulties and and suffered personally um not at the hands of the people who held the contracts 
um, you know, you can think, why does it serve you from a business point of view to, to um, run down, make miserable your, your, your artists? They're not going to do good work for you, you know? Um, Louis B. Mayer went over, you know, Louis B. Mayer went, went above and beyond to try to accommodate Julie's lateness and her pill taking, which by the way, originated with her mother, not with Le Louis B. Mayer. And if you think about it, you're running this business, you've got hundreds of people standing around waiting for Judy Garland or for Marilyn, you know, that's costing you a lot of money. And it becomes a very difficult decision as a leader. Do I fire this, this giant who's one of the most, you know, in Judy's case, one of the most talented people of the century? Do I fire her? Uh, it's a real cost benefit analysis. And we have in the book, Louis B. Mayer really struggling, enlisting Catherine Hepburn to help him figure out what am I going to do about Judy? So, so um, no, they, they were not, they were not exploited. Um, the, you know, that is again, a myth. Um, you know, we, we, it always fascinates me to see how much people, uh, outsiders, um, uh, benefit from this false idea that Hollywood is, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, full of sex and sin and violence and oppression in the case of the studio heads. Um, there, there is a real need. I, I don't want to speak for Europe, but there's a real need for Americans who are not in the business to say Hollywood is bad. And this goes back all the way from the beginning to the Fatty Arbuckle case. Fatty was, of course, accused of rape and murder and then acquitted. Um, and we're seeing the same sort of ideology, you know, replicated today um, in, in terms of the public's understanding of misunderstanding of of Hollywood. And what it comes down to, I think, in America is that Hollywood represents the American dream. Uh, Hollywood is the American dream. And for those who don't have it, there's a lot of jealousy and um, a lot of anger. Um, uh, now, that's not to say that Hollywood is perfect. There, there is, <laughs> there, 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 wherever there are people and wherever there is power, there is going to be, you know, bad behavior. But Hollywood by no means is characterized at any, by, by it any more than any other industry. So you, you put your finger on one of the things that we were really trying to um, disassemble in this book is say, you think you know Hollywood, you, you, you don't, you know? Um, I hope people really look at themselves and, and, and examine um, uh, their negative feelings towards this business. I mean, you love the movies? Well, people made them. Why don't you love those people? The, the, those movies didn't drop down out of the sky. You know, they were made by artists and craftsmen. Um, and and this the Judy Garland Marilyn um, thing gets right to the heart of it. I didn't see this movie um, Blonde for that reason. Uh, seeing the Judy Garland piece of shit was was enough. Um, uh, yeah, no, I'm just I'm just absolutely I'm just absolutely sick of this. Um, this 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 lie yeah yeah i mean uh, the blonde film i i'm very impressed by it as a as a like um a, a kind of repulsion style horror movie i oh the, is that what it is okay, uh, okay. it's it kind of it kind of has elements of that i mean it, i think its problem is that it sets itself up as we're going to tell you the real story of marilyn monroe right. and it's absolutely right. got nothing to do with her i mean yeah. it has her yeah. walking into a studio executive's uh, office, I think it's supposed to be Zel Selnick, and and it, 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 her sort of saying, "What can I do to get, to become a star?" And him just basically bending her over the desk and raping her. Yeah, I mean, where's the, where's it? You know that that that's to me libelous stuff. Mm. I mean, if I was the family of uh, probably Zanuck or Selznick, whoever. Yes, yeah, so I think Zanuck actually. Yeah, your family. Zanuck. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I would be, I would be, I would be suing, um, you know, Zanuck, Zanuck liked girls and, um, but I, I, I don't know, um, I, I don't know of any record of what you're describing. I mean, mm. that's, that's a pretty outrageous claim. I mean, obviously, obviously when we make movies about historical events and personages, we blur the lines a little bit. That's, you know, Shakespeare, Shakespeare did that. But 
hopefully within the spirit of the people that we're talking about. And that is not the spirit of, of Zanuck at all. I mean, that is absolute, that's absolute libel and, and shit. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I hate as a historian that that's out there for people to say, oh, wow, that guy was terrible. You know, mm. that, that guy's a rapist. He raped Marilyn. No, no. I mean, and and how could a filmmaker do that? You know, one who uh, uh, um, what we would imagine reveres uh, films and film history. How could they be so sloppy and selfish as to malign the character of a, a god who was imperfect for their own uh, benefit? I mean, that to me is shameful. I, I think it sort of goes with, I remember Kirk Douglas when he died, you know, within minutes seconds people were um you know sending out uh pictures and memes of of natalie wood as a sort of reference to this rumor that he was um again you know an accusation an unfounded accusation of rape and at the time i i i had that in my head as well and somebody posted an article about it and i so i read deeper about it and it was debunking this claim and saying, you know, there's absolutely zero evidence. There's no, you know, that there's there's supposedly this letter that somebody posted from, but it's totally unsourced and it's totally so. Yeah, it, it sort of it, it, you kind of need a bucket of cold water to throw over these these some of these ideas yes. and and also to to question why we are so ready to accept this without That's with right. without any evidence. I mean, I guess the Weinstein situation uh, is is something which exacerbated this a great deal. As yes, a, well, that's a, that's that's a separate. I mean, that's a separate. That's a pretty clear case. I mean, right. that's a separate deal. You know, um, but the rest of this, the rest of this stuff is allegation, and well, a lot of this stuff is allegation. Not all of it, obviously. Um, but it by no means characterizes Hollywood. You know, that's mm. where this becomes really dangerous in the in the part of people's view is to think that that is what is going on in Hollywood. And also it's really affected the quality of the work that's coming out of Hollywood because the emphasis has shifted in the movie business to morality now to appease this public misconception. It, it's shifted away from aesthetics. You know, we're now making these politically righteous movies that we're supposed to evaluate based upon their ethical content as opposed to their artistic. And this is death. This is absolute propaganda, even though it's propaganda on 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 a side that, you know, we on the good side, you know, this is not Nazi propaganda. But by the way, I would prefer I would prefer Triumph of the Will to any of these movies, you know, for the for the exact reason that Lenny Riefenstahl was a genius. So I, I, I don't care. I, I just want great film. I don't want it to be quote, good in the moral sense. Um, I just want it to be great. And these movies now, you know, uh, are are all virtue, virtue signaling. So that again is another casualty of this, of this madness. I do sometimes think that, I, I was thinking about this recently in terms of uh, there have been a series of films which are about sort of the glory of cinema, how wonderful cinema is. And I haven't seen The Fableman, so I can't put that in this category. But that, I, that sort of slight repugnance that I have for propaganda always gets me with this kind of movie where I think, what about the, you know, what about the uh, sort of how shitty movies can be and how shitty movies can make you feel? Let's not just have the positive propaganda in the movie. You know, we all get that. We're all in the cinema. You don't need to tell us that. Well, a movie that if it makes you feel shitty, it should somehow be shitty with a catharsis. Mm. No one, no one wants to subject themselves to something that just makes you feel shitty. I mean, we have life for that. <laughs> The whole idea of art is to reshape the shitty in in a in a hopeful way. I mean, that's what takes talent. It doesn't take talent to just show you a picture of devastation. You know, we we that is journalism. Um, uh, so so I I I would say a movie that makes you feel shitty, you know, just shitty, uh, without any of the redeeming qualities of of aesthetics or or you know or or structuring the shittiness in a way that gives it new meaning these movies are just shitty and you know works of sadism
So I, I don't like those movies. Going back to the book and back to the way the book is structured, the, when you when you uh, have chapters which are, uh, are specifically about the people making the movies, and it's not just mm-hmm. the, the screenwriters necessarily or the directors, it's the you know the costume designers, the editors, the, the everyone, the, the everyone, thing. exactly, yeah. yeah. That that's just so, so great because even getting those different perspectives, you suddenly go, ah, right. So the costume, Edith Head, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what a <Right>. bitch. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, she. She, she wasn't a bitch. She was tough. She was tough. These people were tough. Right. They were very tough. Um, uh, and uh, Edith had, you know, m- miraculous. I mean, again, to the point we were talking about, this business had to be invented. Edith Head was a school teacher. No right. one was a filmmaker. They were all in other professions first. Uh, but yes, to your point, uh, a movie, a movie is an enormous. A movie is like com- commanding a small army of of artists. So it's a miracle that one even gets made, let alone well. And I, well, the reason I was uh, criticizing you. Head was because um, there's somebody who says, um, I designed that dress. She's got all these Oscars. Why oh. does she have to keep stealing my credit? Yes. Yes. No, Edith Head was a thief. Yeah. Edith <laughs> Head was a thief. Yeah. Yeah. She was a genius, she, but, but, you know, unscrupulous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But even that goes back to the piratical that there's still this sort of little, uh, you know, back and forth with people. Yeah, yes. Arguing about yeah. stuff. Yes. No, we wanted it to be a conversation between people who weren't even in the room. And we worked painstakingly to make it so that one comment from Billy Wilder leads directly into one comment from George Clooney, even though they they never met, um, to show the continuity of ideas and issues and passions that characterize uh, the movie business. Yeah, yes. I mean, Billy Wilder is another sort of hero that I I, I love yeah, coming hero, through this. Hero, he's amazing. Yeah. He's amazing. Sort of imagination, but everything he says about the movies as well is is sort of someone you stop and listen to. He's one of those. Yeah. I think he's. I think there are people who are great movie makers and all the rest of it, and then there are people who are great movie makers and great thinkers about movies. And and yeah. he he's kind of an unsung hero in that sense. Yeah, he's certainly sung in my heart. And I'm always glad that you glad to have you, you know, to sing him, sing him louder. He's he is one of the greats. And yes, as a thinker about movies, too, that's an important that's an important point, you know, and these conversations, they're not just people telling their stories, although that is a part of it or telling the production, t- telling about how to make a movie. There are also philosophies of of film here. And Billy definitely had a strong one and it was geared towards entertainment. And and that, that I mean that that seems to be as well what these factories are, are, are very aware of creating. But that there's not it's not as simplistic as they're just built on commerce and it's just show business. It's sort of like it's got to be well made show business. It's got to be well, yes, well made commercially successful stuff. Yeah, no, there was pride in their work, you know, and they felt a responsibility. They they knew they were speaking to the world. They, they did not significantly. They did not consider themselves as artists. For the most part, they thought of themselves as storytellers, um, and they took their work very seriously. In part because it was fun, you know. All of these people, and you see this throughout the book. All these people were, and I say were, because I'm talking about the studio era. Even though the book chronicles the entire history of Hollywood, these people were having fun. That fun begins to dissipate as you move forward. Mm, yeah. And there's a real sense that, I mean, there's a couple of people who say, you know, I was going into work and I was looking out the window and seeing people walk by and, you know, and it's not just glamorous stars. It's just like just, everybody just enjoying their jobs. Yep. Yep. Of course, you know, and that's that should be easy enough for people to understand. I mean, everyone wants to work in Hollywood and and why not? You get to make movies, you know, you you get to be an artist. You get to hang out with talented people. If you're successful, you get to make, a, you know, a lot of money. Um, you get recognition, fame, notoriety. Um, you know, all of this stuff. This is this is a dream come true. You get to live in beautiful Los Angeles. Um, um, I, and 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 that's something that I, I'm very proud of as a as a native Los Angelino and lifetime resident. You know, I think this is a great place. And part of that is because of the people who come here. You know, I say that that, that Hollywood are, is 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 always Paris in the twenties, always. 
Um, although increasingly less and less so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's always an element of that. Mm. You know, we're all here because we are artists and we love movies of all kinds, all kinds from actors to sound mixers. Mm. Mm -hmm. We live here. We, we live here. We go to the par same parties, the same movies, the same restaurants. We're friends. We know each other. We're excited about what we're working on. We're, we're angry about movies that are shit. Um, it's so fun to be here. And everybody's got a different perspective. Everyone's got yes. slightly different way of looking at things that, yes. that gives you a complete sort of. But, but the perspective is all basically positive. I mean, yeah. I was there's one person who says in the book, you know, people complain about Hollywood. The writers complain about Hollywood, but there were trains leaving every day. They didn't get on them. Right, it reminds you of Mankiewicz sort of saying, you know, exactly. the money's exactly. great, <laughs> and they're yes. idiots. Exactly. It's exactly. your own competition. Right, right. No, ex exactly right. Exactly right. It's not it's not perfect. You know, it's not perfect. Um, but the culture has has exaggerated its imperfections. Mm. Mm. Um, but no, there were trains leaving every day. There still are. And and so as you go through to the I mean, also the other thing, touching slightly on the, the Marilyn Ju uh, Judy Garland thing, but also going to the Marx Brothers and people like that, you just have some of these individuals are just incontainable uncontainable you know the, the marx brothers are so like what the hell do you do with these guys they're just so out of it you know i know i know and that tells you how flexible hollywood was too on top of uh, being fun you know janine my co-author likes to say hollywood is three f's fun family flexibility and <clears throat> she's right flexibility what do you do with these guys how do you make a movie with these guys um hollywood finds a way yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the victims, well, victims is the wrong word, perhaps, but one of the people that I, I wish Hollywood had treated a little better was, was Buster Keaton, because I, I just think he was such a hero. But at the same time, he wasn't necessarily getting the audiences that he... Well you know, right. with I all mean, his best work. It was like when the studio started to control him a bit, actually that was one of his biggest hits. And it was like, you know, it was the opposite of what he wanted to do. It's it's like Marilyn or Judy. How much patience are you going to allow? How many checks are you going to write? If Keaton is not delivering, um, you know, how much faith in the talent do you have? Because it is true, people lose their talent. Uh, people lose their strength. People lose their passion. So these are all decisions that a studio head has to make. No one wants to see Buster Keaton fail, but they have a business to protect. This is not a charity organization, you know. And so when when uh, when does Hollywood start really sort of configuring a sort of legend around itself? You know, when when does that start coming in that real self consciousness? Well, people ask me this question. It always confuses me because I don't under I don't know what it what is the self consciousness. To, I don't know what that means. Well, I guess I guess around about the time that they're making, say, Singing in the Rain, there's all this, there's you know that that suddenly they're looking back on the beginning of Hollywood, the transition to sound as a as a nostalgic moment, which is which I mean, if you think of it in today's dates, it'd be like looking back on the year two thousand as a nostalgic moment. So it's not as... Hollywood was always making movies about Hollywood and filmmaking. I mean, Buster Keaton, you know, for 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 Sherlock instance. Jr. Yes, absolutely. Exactly, right. So, no, Hollywood was always looking at looking at itself. Um, um, but I don't know if that is a part of... I don't know what the self-consciousness of... I don't know what myth came out of that. Mm. Um, if there's any consistent myth. I mean, certainly the view of Hollywood in Singing in the Rain is quite different from the view of Hollywood in, you know, The Player, for yeah. instance. Or Sunset Boulevard, uh, to, to go or back Or Sunset to Mr. Boulevard, Wilder. right. Or Sunset Boulevard, right. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know what Hollywood's view... I, I don't think I could say what Hollywood's view of itself is. Mm. But maybe I'm overlooking something if there's something else that you had in mind. No, no. I mean, I, I think in a way that that sort of it's sort of people complaining about Hollywood and that negative image. Some of that mm -hmm. comes from Hollywood itself. Some of that isn't just external people complaining about it. Some of it is like, 
you know, as you say, my, Michael Tolkien and the player and Robert Altman right. and, and you know, and Billy Wilder, who's absolutely inside the system. But at the same time, Sunset Boulevard is is highly critical of of um, of the way Hollywood leaves people behind. Most of the um, criticism, most of these criticisms happen later. Mm. I, uh, um, Tolkien being a good example when when um, there really does start to be a lot of conflict between the filmmakers and making a movie becomes very hard and very competitive. Um, in the case of Norma Desmond, you know, people are left behind. That's not really a function of Hollywood. It's the function of of any business where someone can no longer perform a job or someone no longer uh, has an audience or the technology has moved on. Uh, Hollywood is no different than, than any other industry in that sense. So while Billy is bitter and acerbic towards Hollywood, um, he really did love it. I mean, Billy was bitter and acerbic towards a lot of things uh, as we see in all of his movies. So Hollywood is not going to um, escape um, his uh, escape his satiric and critical eye. And in fact, if you think about it, I suppose when Norma Desmond does turn up at the studio, she's treated really well. Oh. They're absolutely, you know, uh, you know, love love to see her and and all yes. the rest of it. You know, yes, that's exactly right. I'm glad you brought that up. That that shows you the the. Um, and and let's not forget Norma Desmond was insane. You know, this is not this is a crazy person. You mm. know, she kills him. She has a pet <laughs> monkey. You know, the, the people people have said this to me, you know, like Hollywood drove Nor Norma Desmond crazy. Well, <laughs> I don't know. A lot of people have been uh, have outlived their era and and you know, didn't hold a didn't keep a pet monkey. <laughs> um so we're dealing with a crazy person. Is the pet monkey a particular yeah. red flag for you? Yeah, I would say the pet <laughs> monkey would be if someone has a pet monkey run. Right. Uh, Michael or, Jackson, or, Norma Desmond. Yes, yeah, I would it, say tracks. Michael, it tracks. It does track. <laughs> That's very good. Yeah. That's very good. Yeah, no, Norma Desmond's a killer. Norma Desmond is a it's so interesting to me that people say this. You know, this goes back to what I keep harping on. People see Hollywood as the villain in Sunset Boulevard, but Norma killed a guy. <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> it's wild. The stubborn determination to pin it all on this business. Yeah, I'm ready for my close up. You know, it's I'm it, ready for I my mean, close up. It's it's, it's delusion. Yeah, it's absolutely it's delusion. delusion. Right. But don't right. we don't we always do that? I mean, there's, I I always get weirded out when I go into sort of memorabilia shops or or sort of shops that are selling posters and T-shirts and sort of and not so much memorabilia, but get stuff movie stuff and you see the sort of clockwork orange t-shirts and the travis bickle poster and you think you do know these guys are psychopaths right you know he's a rapist and he's yeah, a mass yeah. murderer i mean yeah just just yeah. out of just out of uh you know yeah just out of curiosity you do know who you think are cool you do know who your heroes are right yeah i don't i don't know if they know or they just know that the iconography is a is part of a trend you know i i don't know how maybe those people People, you know, it's like people you see walking around with Ramones T-shirts. How many of them actually know who the Ramones <laughs> were and are? Um, yeah, these things could just be, you know, just part of the cultural, you know, bit, you know, bit. I don't know what you call it, trend, trend. Mm. I um, so I, you go through like we go through the studio uh, era and we and beyond, and um, and you have that sort of second Renaissance, which is if you like the the 70s where you have all these great great movies but through the 60s and 70s really you have this burgeoning of creativity and really different sort of different different stuff going on um and this of course is when the AFI starts as well because the AFI starts what 1969 as a yeah uh, yeah i think 69 yeah 69 or 667 maybe and the seminar started in 69 some somewhere around there but yes you're absolutely right to tie those two to tie those two phenomena to e to each other, definitely AFI is part of what we call the the, the beginning of the new Hollywood for sure. And I, I mean, I'm re I'm researching my my Malik book at the moment, and of course okay. he he was the first, he was one of the first, he was in that first class. He had uh, 
Malik yes. was uh, with Paul Schrader and Caleb uh, Descanal and De Chanel, yeah, De Chanel, De Chanel, sorry, yeah. Caleb, yeah, you Caleb should Descanel. Sure, <laughs> you, should, you should be sure to contact AFI, and I'll send you the information to get because Malik did um, seminars. Yes, so you got to yes. hear those if you yeah. haven't already. Yeah, absolutely. No, I definitely, definitely need to get those. Um, so, so you've actually got the AFI, kind, and you know, David Lynch is is year two. I mean, year one, Terence Malick, year two, David Lynch. It's not bad for a not school, bad, for a film school, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, those, are, bad. those are pretty big, big people to be, yeah, to, to be setting off. You know, yeah, yeah. AFI has a great has a great record. Um, and that's thanks in part to George Stevens, who was the founder. And then obviously Gene Furstenberg took it over. And now Bob Ghazali is the leader. Um, and th this book is a testament to um, their preservation of history and what they've done for film. You know, this this simply could not have been written without those seminars. I mean, again, I suppose going back to what I was saying earlier about that self-consciousness, this is sort of a positive effect of that self-consciousness because somebody stopped and saying, hey, hang on a minute. Some of this stuff is just disappearing. We need to stop and start preserving it. We need it to stuff. save our history. Yeah, we need to save our history. And AFI is on the forefront of that. I mean, again, there are 4,000 of these things, give or take, and growing. Um, it, it means that AFI will, will never... AFI will never be be beat because of the head start they got. But yes, thankfully to George Stevens that he whose father was George Stevens the director, directed Place in the Sun and Giant more the merrier and Frank. It didn't he photograph a lots of um Laurel and Hardy as well and lots of the Yes, the Laurel early... and Hardy, yes, of course. Um so um yeah, that's part of the Hollywood Renaissance for sure. So, explain a little bit for our uh, for our listeners the the sort of what what were these interview what were these interviewees sort of doing in the AFI? What was the their process? What were they contributing? They were coming to teach the um, fellows, the students, and they would sit around in a very informal, almost living room type atmosphere, and there would be a moderator, and the moderator would interview the filmmaker. Uh, from anywhere to, you know, one to two hours. Um, and the students would ask questions. And uh, the transcripts of those were form the basis for, for this book. Um, some filmmakers, you know, one of the things you learn is you see what great thinkers and teachers a lot of these filmmakers are. You know, William Friedkin, for instance, keeps coming back to AFI because he's just such a good teacher. Uh, Paul Schrader, who actually was a screenwriting teacher at UCLA, um, is a phenomenal speaker. Um, and um, there's so much stuff that we couldn't use, but it's all there in the archive. This just incredible repository of, of, of not just history, but of teaching, because they are talking to the students about, you know, how they were. So, yeah, each each time we jumped into a, a transcript or an interview, it was like, opening a present. What are we going to find here? Maybe it's going to be shit. You know, well, maybe it's going to be shit. Um, maybe it's going to be revelatory. Um, it was so thrilling to, to discover all of this every day. And some of the, and the, the other thing is because they're talking to students and they're talking to students in film who are going to go out and make movies. It's uh, a, a great mix of sort of practical advice as well as theory. It's sort of like, Oh, make sure you do this on a certain day and, you know, uh, have have good. Make sure the catering's sorted because that's really important. And yeah, then, you know, right, right. Though it's a lot. Some of that stuff, but really, it's less. We made the decision to make it less about craft, sure, and more about the history of Hollywood. Mm. Obviously, you can't tell that story without craft. But this is not a book about how to make a movie. You know, no. this is a book about this industry and how it was founded and how it finally you know it 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 peaked and and declined mm, absolutely and when you see this decline i i would there was an event uh, a few years ago where michael bay sort of stormed off a stage because his auto cue didn't work and a friend sent sent me a note saying do you think orson wells would have done that i mean in the sense of 
he, 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 Michael Bay couldn't give extemporary remarks, you know, he had to have his prepared text, you know, in other words, and he sort of said, oh, well, I'm a bit, I, I'm, I'm not very good at talking off the top of my head. And it's like, but all these, you know, you've mentioned William Friedkin. I mean, he could, he could talk for, as an Olympic event, yes. you know? Yes. Well, this is a business of personalities and you get and storytellers. Exactly. And, you know, personality goes with artistic ability, uh, all except for the case of Vincent Minnelli, who was such a genius, but man, is was such a boring interview. You can't believe it. But by and large, um, by and large, personality, you know, uh, and and Michael Bay, as we've heard from stories, you know, has has a tendency and he is a tough he can be a tough guy, but he can also be, you know, a terrific filmmaker. I mean, um, 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 people did not see a movie he made called Pain and Gain, which uh, is a favorite of Janine and mine. Um, uh, a movie I highly recommend to anyone who who either likes or doesn't like Michael Bay. Um, it is a hilarious movie starring, I believe, is it Mark Wahlberg? I can't remember. Or the yeah, Rock, it's the or, Rock. It's both of them. No, it's the Rock. I c can't remember. But man, this movie was a was a, a revelation. I mean, it's so. But anyhow, um, yeah, you you're dealing with personalities here um, uh, all the time, and a lot of stress, and also a lot of a lot of worldwide attention. Mm. Now, if someone stormed off the stage in Detroit you know, at a conference of Ford Motor Company, it would not make um, uh, People Magazine, you know, headlines. We look closer at Hollywood than we do anywhere else. So these things become more magnified. Well, what do you think then looking forward to the to sort of the future of, of Hollywood in terms of how things like streaming are changing things? And, you know, there's a, there's a lot, there's loads of, content uh you know to use a, a despicable word despicable word thank you for saying that yeah <laughs> that that tells you everything that word does yeah doesn't it that tells you everything about the people who are running the movie this word did not come from the filmmakers no this this word comes from the people who are making the decisions about who works and it tells you everything right there that is algorithmic thinking and it's so dangerous it's so dangerous there is that on the one hand, and on the other hand, you know, um, every year films are coming out which absolutely knock me over and and you know delight me. And I, I this year particularly, it feels like post COVID productions have started, which and um, you know you, for two years we've been watching films where we've sort of been going, have you noticed there's only like three people in a in any any <laughs> given shot, and they're all standing very far away <laughs> from true. each other. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Uh, and just, you know, you get the press notes for the films and they're like, you know, this was made during lockdown. And I can tell, I can really yeah, tell. You didn't even yeah. need to tell me that. I was I was perfectly <laughs> aware. But now, but now that we're a little bit out of there and we're starting to get sort of uh, films which are, are no longer particularly restrained in that in that way. And, you know, they're just, um, there are some marvellous films out there. Uh, um. I haven't seen anything I've liked this year, but it's only November. <laughs> <laughs> Oscar season is around the corner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, people still go to the movies, you know? People still go to the movies. Um, only Hollywood is afraid that people are not going to the movies. They, uh, you know, Hollywood's a very conservative, uh, um, in, in a business sense. And so they, and, and, and this new technology streaming enters and Hollywood just starts to get scared um, because movies are so expensive. So um, they, they, they start this myth that no one's going to the movies, which is of course, you know, not, not true. I mean, um, I speak to people all over the country and uh, they say, you know, att attendance is down. Yes. But people still want to go to the movies. Um, they don't, if they don't go, in other words, it's not because they don't want to. Mm. They don't go because their choices are for the most part bad. Um, mm. You know, you you look at a, you know, the, the, the big movies still open big. Uh, the rest, the rest don't. 
and they would they would play bigger and longer if if they were better. But the word of mouth on these most of these movies is so bad mm, mm. Um, that after opening weekend, they just uh, fizzle and die. You know, um, it's hard to think even people. What won Best Picture last year? Coda. Yeah. Coda. Was it? No one's yeah. going to watch that. Thing. No one watches that thing. Any. No one watched that thing when it came out. No, I, have, I haven't uh, seen it, and I've seen every single Best Picture winner except Coda. Right. So there. So so there you go. I mean, that's that's what's happening. Um, now you want to go. You want people to go to the movies. Don't make Coda. Make something great. Make something great. And it shows you how impoverished the offerings are. That a movie like Coda, which would be, you know. Uh, a B minus in any healthy Hollywood is elevated to an A by default. It's very mm. scary. Mm. It's very scary. Yeah. And then you've got the big tentpole pictures, things like Black Adam and, you know, uh, Jurassic World. I mean, I'm not even sure how they're performing, but critically, they're just absolutely, you know, there's no good word of mouth. Even people who are going to see them are, are saying they're rubbish. So I've, you've paid yeah. your ticket, but you they're not, you know, and those that sort of I don't know. I mean, the, the the films that I've loved this year have actually all more or less. Well, no, I mean, I saw White Noise at Venice that I really liked. I really liked Bones and All, which I also saw at Venice. I All Quiet on the Western Front, which has just come out on Netflix, deserved to be like the hot ticket and people going to the cinema and saying it's sold out. What? Let's get the next, you know, showing and, and talking about it in the foyer. It deserved to be that sort of film, but instead it's, it's on Netflix. So, you know. Yeah. And that ain't the movies, you know, that, yeah. that ain't the movie. It's uh, it's too bad. It's, it's really too bad. I mean, it's definitely the theater going public is getting smaller. I mean, I, I will say that, but it's a, it's a chicken or the egg thing. People will leave the house if you give them a reason to leave the house. Uh, you know, I was talking to a theater owner in New York. He put it so well. He said, he said, you know, the advent of 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 home delivery food didn't destroy the restaurant. Right. You know, we can still get pizza delivered, but we also sometimes want to go out for pizza. Now, why do you go out for we have in America like, you know, what's called Domino. I don't know what year you got pizza express. I forget what you got. Yeah. Well, I'm in Italy, so I've got. Oh, you're in Italy. I always I got, forget. I've I got proper pizza. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I always forget. Okay. You have the real thing. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly my point. Where, where, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. You know, if you're yeah. in Italy, you're going out to eat because, but if the food is shit, you know, why, why, why go to the theater, so to speak? Yeah, yeah. I was talking to a, a cinema owner in one of the, met him in a queue at a festival, and he mm -hmm. was telling me that everybody has it wrong. You're not, you're not, you, cinemas have never been competing with television and with, um, no true. Because, because people want to go out. So yes. it's when they make the decision to go out, uh, a, a cinema is actually uh, competing with the theater, the opera. Yep. And, and yep. restaurants, you know, can we yep. give you as good a night out as you would if you just went to a restaurant or a bar, you know? That's right. And and if we can give you something extra or if we can sort of combine that in some way, then you can, you know, a perfect evening can be had for all, you know? Absol absolutely. A, a better evening probably yeah. than you have have at home. Y yeah. Um, so I, I'm glad to hear that you had you had that that experience, too. Yep. One one question I wanted to ask, and then and then I'll uh, I'll let you go. Um, but I was reminded when I was reading your your book as well of the um, of the Coen Brothers treatment of oh. Hollywood with Barton Fink and yes. um, Hail Caesar uh, more yes. recently. Um, what did you What did you make of those those portraits? Well, I mean, Barton Fink is like a, is the greatest portrait of a screenwriter you can imagine. I mean, I love Barton Fink so much. I mean, they got it absolutely, they got it absolutely right. Uh, I have total reverence for that, for that movie. Um, Hail Caesar, I thought was messy. Mm. Um, it's a bit skitty, right? Yeah, yeah. Hail Caesar, I thought was messy, although it's Coen Brothers, so you're always happy you saw it. There's always great stuff in Coen Brothers. God bless them. Um, but Barton Fink is 
the movie about what it me means to be um, a writer, uh, a screenwriter, uh, especially in that era, um, coming from New York, a place, a, a literary city, LA is not a literary city, uh, coming uh, and, and thinking the movie business is going to be one thing and then discovering what the movie business is and little by little becoming emotionally alienated from himself and from his work. That's that's a story that, that went for a lot of screenwriters in that era. Um, now, a screenwriter coming from New York w w would be naive to assume that screenwriting and the theater are the same thing. Or, you know, in the case of the John Mahoney character, the, the William Faulkner character in Barton Fink, that screenwriting and literature were the same thing. I mean, this is not, this is not, screenwriting is not writing in, in the sense of the theater and, and um, uh, 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 literature. Screenwriting is outlining, you know, this is an industrial document that is written for people who do not like to read. And if you are a screenwriter <laughs> and you don't understand that, as Barton Fink didn't and William and, and, and William Faulkner and Fitzgerald, if you don't understand that, you're in for a rude awakening. Um, but that is your job as a, as a screenwriter. Um, you're, you're, you're writing a menu. You're not in the kitchen. Um, and when you're a when you're a novelist, you are writing a menu and you're in the kitchen. Um, so Barton Fink gets that um, better than anything else. To say nothing of the playfulness and ingenuity of the filmmaking and the beauty of the design and uh, the originality of the story and how it gets writer's block. Uh, you know, it finds a cinematic equivalent for writer's block. That's so hard to do. It shows externally an internal process, mm -hmm. you know? It doesn't resort to the cliches of ripping the page out of the typewriter, crumpling it up, throwing it. You know, whenever you see one of those in a writer movie, you think, oh, here we go. Here we go, one of those. Um, no, Barton Fink is a total, total, total work of total originality. What I love about that movie is how you think he's the hero. And then I watched it recently, re-watched re it recently. It must be one of the films I've seen the most. And I just I just thought, there's no evidence whatsoever that this guy's got more than one good idea. You know, the whole, the right. whole joke is yes. every, everything he does is just a reiteration of the, his first play. Yes, and that's why part of one of the reasons he evokes the Clifford Odette's story which is one of the spiritual bases for that you know you could say i love odets but he you know he had his one idea man uh and he came to hollywood expecting to find a you know broadway and he found hollywood um uh yeah, but you're right that that is a wonderful little turn in that movie that that and, and barton fink thinks he knows the common man thinks he knows yeah barton fink is wrong god what a movie because you won't listen, John Goodman's yes. character. Yes. You know, it's yes. like it's yes. like a brilliant shout to any writer. You know, shut yes. shut up and listen yes. to the guy next that, to you. That's right. That's right. You get so consumed in yourself that you start to lose the world, and that's madness. After this sort of monumental work that you've done with with Janine Basinger, who who's who, by the way, since I talked to you last year I, I guess it was probably a year ago now about your chinatown book not the big goodbye the big goodbye the big goodbye yeah that's oh, yeah. it yeah i was gonna yeah. say the long Got goodbye it. and then now no that's raymond chandler oh that was chandler that was chandler yeah. i take I, I wish i could take credit i can't yeah <laughs> and um uh you recommended that i read janine uh basinger and i uh and, and so i did i read the star machine and what a what a yeah. wonderful book that is that's incredible isn't it amazing. incredible she yeah. knows more about this than anyone on the planet and you just have to read the star machine or any of her other books to uh to see she's yeah. the boss yeah absolutely and so what are what are you uh so is there anything come on it coming down the pipeline that you're working on that you can tell us about yeah, next year I have uh, the story of Zoetrope, uh, Francis Ford Coppola's Zoetrope. Wow. Uh, and uh, that'll be out next year. So hopefully you and I will do this again then. On an annual basis. <laughs> I I would look forward to it, if, if not before. 
yeah if absolutely. not before absolutely have you uh, have you got any sort of have you read any film books recently that you'd you'd like to recommend just my own <laughs> that's the only film book i've been reading is my own over and over and over again you know it's like it's like when you're in the theater on broadway you can't go see other shows yeah. when you're writing a book it's very hard for me to read anything else um no i can't say i'm looking around my living room now to see if there's anything piled up here that i've, I've read. no nothing what about you um yeah i've been reading loads <laughs> I've been reading yeah. loads of books. I'll tell you what I'm really into at the moment, which is a break from film books. Do you know those yeah. uh, new American library books? You know, the the black with the red and oh, white yes. band around? Yes, I've, I've yes. become addicted to those. And, yeah, and those it means beautiful. They're so gorgeous. And I, you get a little ribbon yeah. to hold your place. Yes, isn't that nice? And, and the paper is so beautiful. The typescript is so clear. So I'm rereading Lovecraft, who I haven't read for some years. Oh! How is it? I've never read Lovecraft. It's it's terrible, but really mm -hmm. well. It's really badly written, but at the same time, <laughs> so uniquely badly written that it makes you kind of, it, it, some of it's so beautifully done. I mean, it, it really is sort of like, you know, the, the, the list of adjectives, the, sinis the sinister, demented, quivering. Oh, God. Oh. The, yeah, it goes on it's and on and on. Yeah. No, but it's it just it's so committed to what it's doing that you can't help but kind of uh, fall in love with him after a while. Um, well, I'll 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 have I'll have a look. I mean, I'll I'll dip in and probably dip right out. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the beauty of him. He's a short story writer. So you you read Call of Cthulhu. If you don't like that, then you won't like anything. You know. All right, that's, that that might be what I do. That might be <laughs> might be what I do. Um, that the. Um, that that well, I'm trying to think. I'm just trying to think if there's anything. No. I'm, oh, oh! I'll tell you what I've read yeah, recently as well. Tell the, me the Paul Newman. Uh, memoir. Oh, I I hear that's quite good. I it's haven't read. Excellent. That. It's excellent. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, I actually put it on, got it on Audible, and listened to Jeff Daniels does the does the audio version, and um, it's really interesting because he's so um, candid and. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of things I never knew about Paul Newman. I thought, you know, I know what everybody else knows, the beautiful blue eyes, the sort of a little bit of right. rivalry with Brando and Montgomery Cliff and that generation. But when you read him, he, you know, he didn't enjoy acting. He was a he was a he, he drank a hell of a lot. He was uh, pretty um, unfaithful in his private life. Um, and 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 he's kind of very, very he doesn't really like himself very much. There's a lot of unhappiness and anger there. And yet by the end of it, he's, he, again, he kind of wins you over because you feel he's being way too hard on himself. You know, mm. you feel that yeah. he's being really, you know, uh, he talks about breaking with his mother, his mother saying something uh, bad about his wife and uh, about Joanne Woodward and him saying, that's it. I'm, uh, you're getting out of the car and basically stopping the car and and leaving her on the street. And oh my he, god! And he says, "I didn't talk to my mother for 15 years after that." Oh my god! And it, and and he says it's something really interesting. He says, "I I gratefully welcomed the excuse to." You know, it, it wasn't like I was really that angry that it was really that bad a thing that she said. It was just like I'd been looking for an excuse to just cut what off. What a great phrase to to gratefully welcome an excuse. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I am putting that on my very short list. I may go out and get it today and then not read it for a month. But I would love I'm very I'm very glad you reminded me about that. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a good one to. In fact, I'm trying to work out a way of doing an episode on it because yeah you should <laughs> because you should. obviously paul's not around to to actually interview so um yeah you should definitely do that yeah yeah i i shall do well listen sam it's been really good talking to you thank you so much for Darn. your time thank you for reaching out for reading this enormous book for having such passionate questions and making this so fun thank oh. you
so that was my conversation with Sam. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. He uh, is a, as you can tell, he's a really easy to get on with guy. It's a really fun guy to talk to. We have a, a definite simpatico, as they say. His book is available and I absolutely fully recommend it as you could probably tell from my enthusiasm during the episode hollywood and oral history by sam wasson and janine basinger okay that's all that's left for me to do is thank ellie atkins for the music ali harwood for the artwork and thank you listener for tuning in next week um who have we got next week oh we've got a brilliant writer next week rachel abramovitz and her book, Women's Experience of Power in Hollywood, Is That a Gun in Your Pocket? Really uh, can't wait to have that conversation uh, go out uh, into the world. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Until next time, take care.